<laughs> the Johnson Wax Program with Fibber McGee and Molly. The makers of Johnson's Wax for home and industry present Fibber McGee and Molly, written by Don Quinn, with music by the King's Men and Billy Mills Orchestra. When you apply wax to the various surfaces around your home, I wonder if you realize how many different purposes you're serving. I'd like to mention four important ones, and I'll be brief. First, and something that's both patriotic and essential today, you're practicing conservation. Johnson's Wax, regularly applied, gives protection against wear, makes your things last longer. Second, you're adding rich, glistening beauty to every room of your home to be enjoyed by your entire family. And third, you're saving yourself many hours of work all year because dirt does not readily cling to a Johnson Wax surface. And fourth, which some of you may not fully realize, you are helping to protect the health of your family. It's an obvious fact and easily proven that a waxed home is a clean home and a clean home is a healthful one. So it's definitely profitable to invest a very small amount of money and a modest amount of your time to enjoy all these advantages made possible by a regular use of Johnson's Wax, paste, liquid, or cream. The squire of 79 Wistful Vista is full of the spirit that will win the war. The spirit of 1875. Yes, with $20 in hand, he's gone downtown to buy a bond for 1875. His wife is telling a neighbor about it on the phone. As we meet, Fibber McGee and Molly. Oh, of course, we've been buying bonds on a regular schedule, too, Mrs. Toops, but... McGee suddenly got $20 for selling an old camera, and he was going to use it to make a down payment on a new gold-mounted elk's tooth. But uh, I talked him into buying an extra war bond. I guess I should have gone with him, but... Hey, Molly! Molly, look what I got! Hey, Molly! Look what I got! Uh, just, uh, just a minute, McGee. Huh? I was right, Mrs. Toops. I should have gone with him. I'll call you back. Goodbye. Look. What's all the excitement? Look, 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 look. Take a gander at this. Heavenly days, a diamond ring. A diamond ring? This is the diamond ring. This is the ring of your dreams, baby. Oh, dear. Look at the size of that. Why, you could cut your way out of a department store window in three minutes with this. <laughs> now, stop jumping around a minute, McGee. Calm yourself. Now, where'd you get this diamond and why? I've been trying to tell you. I was on my way downtown to buy this bond, see? You mean you didn't buy it? No, because when I met this guy... But you went downtown for the one and only purpose of buying a war Yeah, I know, but when I met this... And you didn't do it. No, look, will you let me explain? Oh, go ahead. Just pretend I'm an American soldier from Bataan in a Japanese prison camp and try to make me understand what was important enough to keep you from buying a war bond. Oh, my gosh, when you put it like that, it don't seem like such a good deal. But I thought it was a... Well, gee whiz. Well, tell me about it, dearie. I don't want to scold you before I know what to scold you about. <laughs> well, now, look. Here I was on my way downtown, see? So I stood in front of the jewelers to look at that beautiful gold-mounted elk's tooth that you made me buy a bond instead of. And up comes this guy. Was he nine feet high? No. Of course not. Why should he be nine feet high? Well, if this is one of your tall stories, I wanted him to be able to see what was going on. <laughs> This is the absolute truth. May lightning strike me where I stand if I ain't giving it to you straight. <laughs> now, that's no fair. You got rubber-soled overshoes on. Well, anyway, this guy ups to me and he shows me this ring he found lying in the gutter at 14th and Oak Streets. I wish you wouldn't talk to people who go around lying in gutters. He wasn't lying in the gutter. The ring was lying in the gutter. Oh. So the guy shows me the ring, see? Very pretty, I says. What do you mean, very pretty, he retorts. This stone has got enough fire to roast marshmallows on. <laughs> oh, I ejaculate. A hot rock. Oh. No, he screams. Now, look, McGee, never mind the actual dialogue. 
Make like it was for the Reader's Digest. Content, uh, condense it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this guy tells me I got an honest puss. And would I take the ring and watch the want ads and see that it was returned to the rightful owner? So I gave him the 20 bucks to show my good faith, and this is the ring. I see. Well, if the ring is so valuable, why didn't the man watch the want ads and collect the reward himself? Ah, uh -huh, I knew you were going to ask me that. And I'll tell you why he didn't wait. The man had to catch a train. Oh. <laughs> Why, McGee, he was just a confidence man. Sure he was. He had enough confidence in me to know that I... I mean he was a crook. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I'd like to meet more crooks that would sell me four-carat diamond rings for 20 bucks. <laughs> and whoever advertises for it can hardly offer less than 100 bucks reward. So instead of buying one war bond for 1875, I can buy five of them. See? I'll probably have it by tomorrow, and I can dash Listen, right... listen. Hmm? If everybody who was going to buy bonds tomorrow would buy them today, we could be a lot prouder of yesterday tomorrow. When I think how those poor... Oh, hi, Alice. Hey, take a gander at the diamond ring I just bought. I better just squint at it at first. It, it's pretty dazzling. Yeah. <laughs> Our rolling moss has just gathered himself a stone, Alice. Jeepers, that's quite a diamond, Mr. Hmm, McGee. I'll say. Like an ice cube looking for a glass of water. <laughs> how much would it be worth if it was real? <laughs> What do you mean, if it was real? By George... He says it is real, Alice. A man found it and sold it to McGee for $20, and McGee can claim the reward, <coughs> if any. Oh, oh, that reminds me. I, uh, I, uh, well, may I speak to Mrs. McGee alone a minute? Why, sure, Alice. Go fix the furnace, McGee. What's the matter with it? <laughs> Nothing's the matter with it. Go shovel off the sidewalk or something. I did shovel off the sidewalk just this morning. Oh, to... for goodness sakes, go away, dearie. Alice wants to speak to me privately. Oh, well, gee whiz, why don't you say so? <laughs> I can take a hint. Uh, <laughs> will you excuse me, Mr. McGee? Sure, sure, sure. And if you shot somebody and want me to help you dispose of the body, just say so. I belong to the crime club. <laughs> Oh, what's the trouble, Alice? Oh, Mrs. McGee, I, I feel so ashamed. Oh, don't be silly, dear. Everybody makes mistakes. That's why umpires wear so much padding. <laughs> well, to think that at my age, I... Well, you and Mr. McGee have always been so nice to me. I feel that I... Well, I think you should be the first to know that... That I can't pay my rent this week. Oh, well, it's about time. You know, you've been so prompt every week, I was beginning to worry. <laughs> but now, what's the matter? Have you been laid off at the airplane plant? Oh, no, but I spent my money this week for an extra war bond. Well, good for you. Oh, I really hated to do this, Mrs. McGee, but just so I won't be too far behind in my rent, here's the $15 for next week. Oh. <laughs> I see. Well, uh, you can't pay your rent this week, but you're paying it for next week. Yes, that's the least I can do. And thank you for waiting for this week's rent. You can come back now, Mr. McGee. See you later, Mrs. McGee. Okay. What's the... What's the kid done now? She in some kind of a jam? No, she couldn't pay this week's rent is all, and it embarrassed her. Oh, I know how she feels. That's why I never owned a trunk when I was a young guy. It's too hard to lower a trunk out of a window at night. <laughs> I remember one but time... But listen, she paid next week's rent so she wouldn't get too far behind. Well, that was very decent. Oh. <laughs> Wait, she, she couldn't pay this week, but... So she wouldn't get too far behind, she... Let's see now. If she paid for next week and didn't pay this week, next week rent would be two weeks behind when the... Oh, that'd be... If next... Oh, this is ridiculous. Or is it? Well, now, let me think. One week's rent is... But if she paid... But for... if... Billy Mills and his orchestra playing I'm Just Wild About Harry.
what I say. If she paid for next week, it's the same as paying for this week, isn't it? Why, certainly not. She said this money's for next week, so she's paid for two weeks, you see. Except that she owes us for one week. <laughs> no, she owes us for one week, then she's only paid for... Hey, where's my ring? What did I do with my diamond? Oh, my gosh, I've lost it. Where is it? Hey, help me look for it, Molly. Help me. Oh, calm where's yourself. It? Huh? Look, you're wearing it on your finger. Oh, whew. Boy, what a scare. I got an investment in this thing. I got to all watch the want ads pretty close, too, now. Hey, what time does the evening paper show up? About three days after the paper boy hides it in the shrubbery. <laughs> well, you keep an eye peeled for the paper kid tonight. If somebody offers a hundred bucks reward for this ring, I don't want to miss the chance to... Come in. Oh, heavenly days, it's Mr. Wellington. Good day, Mrs. McGee. You're looking very charming. And McGee, you're looking. <laughs> Hi, Wellington. I'm glad you came in. We were at your theater the other night, and I got a complaint. If it is in reference to the patented seats which spring up when you lean over to speak to someone, causing you to squat on the floor with some violence, they have already been called to my attention. <laughs> well, I think he wants to complain about your newsreels, uh, Mr. Wellington. Exactly. I don't mind spending an evening watching Francis X. Bushman throw in his profile at Beverly Bain. But you might at least get some up-to-date newsreels, Sig. Yeah. We know Woodrow Wilson was elected. Yeah. <laughs> and we know Pershing got back from France all right. And that they're now carrying mail and airplanes. Yeah, we know all that. And furthermore, we get awful sick of seeing shots of women smacking a bottle of champagne with the front end of a boat. <laughs> Have you finished? <laughs> I don't want to interrupt. <laughs> yes, Mr. Wellington. What was it you wanted, Sig? Not a thing, old fellow. Just strolling by, cold day, stopped in to get warm. I am. Good day. <laughs> Good day, Mr. Wellington. And I shall take your criticisms under serious consideration. Though I may spend less time in the future as manager of the Bijou Theater, so the results of your complaints may be rather unsatis. Factory? Mm, yes, if my draft board insists. <laughs> On him, McGee. He's rather a nice man. Ah, he's too fine-haired to suit me. He takes too serious the fact that he was born in Superior, Wisconsin. Say, is that uh, anywhere near Starved Rock, Illinois, if you'll forgive my mentioning it? Forgive it? Why, bless you, my child. I was wondering how I could get around to it myself. <laughs> Good old Starved Rock, Illinois. <laughs> I got an old friend living there, a fellow by the name of Fred Nittany. Fred Nittany. Mm -hmm. That name is familiar. I probably heard me mention it. <laughs> yep. Fellow was a, uh, Fred was a fellow that he and I had a vaudeville act together. Oh, that Fred Nittany. Yeah. We trooped together for years, Fred and me. I ever tell you about the time we were... Hello, folks. Hello, Mr. Wilcox. Hi, Junior. I was just going by, and I thought I'd stop it. Well, who gave you the phony sparkler, pal? Libby Owens? <laughs> it isn't glass, Mr. Wilcox. It's a real diamond. Quite a rock, ain't it, Junior? This is bigger than the one the Pilgrims landed on. It's about four carats. Just bought it this afternoon. Man found it downtown. McGee's just holding the ring till the rightful owners advertise for it. It's a beauty, ain't it, Junior? Yes, but I still don't think it's real. A real stone would have more sparkle. Say, I thought this diamond had lots of sparkle, Mr. Wilcox. It has. Why, with the light this thing shoots out, Junior, I don't dare wear it out at night. The moths that keep flying into it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, horse feathers. Hold it over here and compare it. Compare it with what? The sparkle and glitter of this Johnson wax tabletop. Oh, oh my <laughs> God. If we were showing him the Mona Lisa, he'd claim she was smiling because the picture frame was Johnson Wax. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding, folks. Look at that ring and compare it with the brilliant surface of this tabletop. Look at the luster of that waxed surface. Look at the depth and the beauty of the grain of the wood. Can you, by any stretch of the imagination, compare that to a repulsive old diamond? Say, remind me to have this table set in the gold mounting, McGee. <laughs> I'll wear it to bingo parties. Yeah. <laughs> And when you think that a diamond, a diamond is merely ornamental, and Johnson's wax is so useful, protecting and preserving and beautifying floors, woodwork, furniture, and a thousand other things. Why, who'd want diamonds when they could get Johnson's wax? I would. May Racine forgive me? <laughs> <laughs> Incidentally, uh, where'd you say you bought this ring, pal? Downtown. I found it in the gutter at 14th and Oak. Oh, I see. You mean he found it and sold it to you for 20 bucks? Yes. Yeah. And said for you to watch the want ads because somebody would probably offer $100 for the return of it, and he'd do it himself except he had to catch a train? That's it, Mr. Wilcox, word for word. Why, you must have been there and heard the whole thing. How did you know, Junior? How did I know? Oh, brother. So long, sucker. <laughs> I think he thinks you got taken, McGee. Why, that's impossible. Anybody could tell that this diamond is extremely valuable. 
Might be a good idea to take it downtown and have it a pray, so... Ah, oh, but that's silly. Just because... Well, I've got to go write out my grocery list for dinner, McGee. Let me know how the argument comes out. Yeah. I'd be interested to know whether you made an investment or a mistake. Hmm, fine thing. Nobody ever believes I can do anything. Other people make fancy big deals and nobody sneers at them. What is it about me that makes people scoff? My gosh, I can't... Come in. Hi, mister. Oh, hi, sis. You seen anything of the paper boy? <laughs> What's so funny about that? I just says, have you seen anything of the paper boy? Oh, the paper boy's a girl, I bet you. <laughs> he is? I mean, is she? Or since when? Since Harry Toops, uh -huh. that's Willie Toops' brother, started working in Kramer's drugstore after school, and he sold his paper out to his sister, Teresa Toops, for $7, and threw in a bicycle pump, only the pump wouldn't work, so Teresa... Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> I didn't ask for a history of the newspaper business back to Richard Harding Davis. I just asked you if you, uh, if the evening papers had been delivered. You did not, I bet you. You asked me if I'd seen the paper boy, and Teresa Toops isn't a boy, she's a girl. And when she found the bicycle pump wouldn't work... I don't want to hear about the bicycle pump. I'm not interested in bicycle pumps. You got a bicycle, mister? No. That's why, then. Hmm? Plus, when Teresa Toops found out her bicycle pump wouldn't work, she... Stop it, will you? I tell you, I don't want to hear about any bicycle pump. I merely want to know if the evening papers have come. Can you answer that, yes or no? No. Huh? Hmm? Doggone it, have the evening papers come in. <laughs> yes. Oh, boy, that's the news. But not yours, though. Why not mine? Because cause Teresa Toops didn't get this far because she had a puncher and her bicycle pump wouldn't work. Oh, skip it. <laughs> all you can talk about is bicycle pumps. Oh, I've been talking about the same one all the time, mister. Well. The bicycle pump that Willie Toops' brother Harry sold to Teresa when his paper wrapped. For the love of Pete, stop it! <laughs> okay. Now look, sis, let's be reasonable. Forget Teresa's pumps for a minute. I want to make you a deal. Okay, mister, but you know about the woman power shortage. You make it good. Right. Two bits. You get me an evening paper and I'll give you two bits. Buy one, borrow one, beg one. But get one, see? Gee, it must be pretty important, mister. What you want a paper so bad for? I want to see the want ads, if you must know. Well, then will you do me a favor, mister? Sure, what's that? If you see anything in the want ads about somebody wanting to sell a good bicycle pump, Teresa... Dad, Brandon, don't get the paper! Hey, Mr. The Kingsman and the Surrey with the fringe on top. When I take you out tonight with me, honey, here's the way it's gonna be. You will sit behind a team of snow white horses in the slickest gig you ever hope to see. Chicks and ducks and geese bed scurry when I take you out in Surrey. When I take you out in the Surrey with the fringe on top. Watch that fringe and see how it flutters When I drive those high-step shutters Nosy folks will peep through the shutters And their eyes will pop The wheels are yellow, the upholstery's brown The dashboard's genuine leather With eyes and glass curtains you can roll right down In case there's a change in the weather Two bright side lights winking and blinking Ain't no finer rig I'm a thinking You can keep your rig if you're thinking that I care to swap for that shiny little surly with a fringe on the top. All the world will fly in a flurry when I take you out in the surry. When I take you out in the surry with the fringe on top. When we hit that road bent for leather, cats and dogs will dance in the heather. Birds and frogs will sing all together and the toes will hop. The wind will whistle as we rattle along. Don't you wish you could go on forever? Don't you wish you could go on forever and never stop in that tiny little shiny little Surrey with all the fringe on the top? Oh my gosh, I wish that evening paper would come. I thought you said the little girl for one. Oh, that kid is disresponsible. Look, do you, do you think I got gypped on this ring, Molly? Well, frankly, yes, dearie. Oh, I guess you're right. 
But I can fix that. Just watch me unload it on somebody. Maybe I buy dumb, but I sell smart. <laughs> oh, maybe that's the little girl with the paper. Come in. Hello, folks. Remember me? I'm Beulah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oops, this new cook. Hi, Beulah. How do you like your new position, Beulah? Ma'am, I've been bending over a stove for 15 years now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the job is new, but the position ain't. <laughs> See, did the uh, uh, Toops children bother you very much, Beulah? Oh, no, ma'am. In fact, one of the biggest moments of my day is helping them little children get off to school. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Watching them walk down the street hand in hand. Oh, that's kind of sweet. Yeah, sir. Only thing that bothers me is I know sooner or later they're coming back home again. <laughs> well, so you like it at Toops, is eh, Beulah? Yes. Anyway, I, I never leave the place without I give plenty of notice. Oh. In my last job, everything worked out perfect. I worked there two weeks, took two weeks vacation, and give them two weeks notice. <laughs> that's about what happened to the last cook we had. She was a good cook, as cooks go. And as cooks go, she went. Oh, look at that. <laughs> he real amused, lady man. <laughs> well, I might as well agree. It'd be two against one. Well, I hope Mrs. Toops don't work you too hard, Beulah. Oh, no. The work ain't hard. It's the walking back from the garage that wear me out. Well, uh, why do you have to go out the garage all the time? That's involuntary, ma'am. Every time I goes out to the ice box on the back porch... I stepped on one of little Willie's roller skates, and the next thing I know is I'm sitting in the garage. <laughs> Good thing they leave the garage door open. They didn't the first time. Yeah. But now it's open for hmm. Oh, uh, excuse me, ma'am. I almost forget. Mm -hmm. Miss Toop sent me over here to return his eggs she borrow. Heavenly days, I don't remember ever borrowing. Why, that was Thanksgiving Day, Molly, remember? They borrowed an egg to make eggnog? That's oh. exactly the time, sir. Mm -hmm. They didn't make no eggnog, so they returned the same egg. <laughs> <laughs> and it's as good as new. Thank you very much. Well, that's okay, Well, it's very thoughtful of them to return the same egg. Shows a great respect for property rights. Yeah. They weren't going to return just any old egg, no, sir. I'll well, be careful with it. A two-month-old egg is a lethal weapon. <laughs> <laughs> it's lethal. Oh. What'll I do with it? Left it near the front door. <laughs> I'll return it to more toops if I see him walking past after dark. Doggone it, I gotta unload this ring. I wonder who I... Come in. Oh, hello, Dr. Gamble. Ah. Hello, Mrs. McGee. Hello, McGee. Hi, Arrow Smith. What's the good word? Epidemic? Oh. <laughs> you know, McGee, there are times when you remind me of Mark Twain. As a humorist, Doctor? No, just as someone who's been dead for some time. <laughs> he has a certain zombie quality that... Well, 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 where did you get the racetrack diamond, McGee? In a box of Cracker Jack? Genuine diamond, Doc. It's a beauty, ain't it? Mm. Four carrots, at least. Just bought it this afternoon. You just bought a four-carat diamond? That's disgusting. What? What do you mean, that's disgusting? Why, a diamond that size must have cost $2,000. Well, so what? With the country needing every spare nickel to pay the cost of this war and pile up some savings to prevent inflation after the war, you've got a colossal nerve to stand there and tell me you've been buying four-carat diamonds. Yeah, but Dr. Gamble... What's the matter with you, McGee? What? Have you got any sense of responsibility? Think you can hand a bunch of men some rifles and say, you go fight for me, chum. I'll stay here and buy diamonds? Why, certainly not, but gee whiz. You realize that American citizens have their choice right now of either storing up savings or storing up trouble? We can either buy war bonds and have a nice golden nest egg after the war, or we can throw our money away and kill the goose. Yeah, but Dr. When McGee bought that diamond ring... Don't you know that with Tokyo and Northern Europe in our bomb sites, we're really just getting into this war? Talk about a second front. You know where the second front is? In your wallet, son, and don't forget it. Disgusting short sport like you with a four-carat diamond. <laughs> Envious, huh? Ah. <laughs> you ought to have a ring like this, Doc. Make you look prosperous. I don't want to look prosperous. I want to look as seedy as possible. If I look prosperous, nobody would pay their doctor bills. <laughs> as it is, they feel sorry for me and throw me a couple of dollars now and then. Maybe a little flashy for a doctor, McGee. Oh, it's no such a thing. Here, try it on your pinky, Doc. Well... There. Why, it looks swell on him, don't it, Molly? Sure, mm. sure. I, I bought it to wear myself, Doc, but... Gee, when I see it looks so good on you, I, I'd let it go for 200 bucks. 
$200. McGee, why are you charging the doctor so much? What do you mean? You only paid $20 for it. <laughs> oh. So he only paid $20 for it. Isn't that interesting? Why, you chiseling now, wait little... Minute, Doc, wait a minute. Now, let uh... me explain. I merely want to get my dough back so I can buy a war bond, Doc. Huh. That's all. Cross my heart. Give me 20 bucks and it's yours. You wouldn't be coming to the conclusion that this is stolen property and getting cold feet, would you, my friend? No, sir. I just want to get my dough back and go buy a bond. Very patriotic. But just to prove that I can go along with a gag, here. Here's $20. Oh, thanks. Five, ten, fifteen, twenty. Okay. Now, I'll see that he buys a bond first thing in the morning, Doctor. Yeah. And furthermore, Doc Gamble, you got no business buying diamond rings when the country needs every cent for war bonds. <laughs> You know where the second front really is? It's in your big fat wallet, son. That's disgusting. A sports shirt like you with a four-carat diamond. Oh, don't get me wrong, McGee. I'm not buying this ring for myself. Well, who are you buying it for, Doctor? I'm returning it to the owner. Didn't you see the want ads in the paper tonight? Huh? This is obviously the ring that was lost at 14th and Oak Ooh. Street that they're offering a reward of $300 in war bonds mean... for. I'll let you know. Ooh. Why, that dirty chisel devil talk... Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. A while ago, your local announcer gave you a phone number. That's because we have arranged for your radio station to stand by the telephone to take your orders for war bonds. Will you please call them? Tell them you'd like to buy a war bond from Fibber McGee and Molly? You've been wonderful to us all these years, and we don't often ask any favors, but won't you please buy an extra bond tonight? We'd like to make this the biggest evening in war bond selling. And all over the United States, radio station staffs are waiting to take your calls, and they'll wait all night if necessary. Call the number that was given you right now. And if the line is busy, call again. Our men in uniform don't fire one shot and quit, and we know you won't. If it's impractical for you to telephone your radio station, send them a telegram or a letter, but please buy another bond. We don't think it's necessary. You all read the papers and listen to the radio. And you know there are things this country must do in Europe and in the Pacific, things which can only be done with bombs and bullets and men and money. So get in touch with the station you're listening to right now. They're waiting for you. In just a few seconds, your announcer will repeat the telephone number in case you missed it the first time. An extra bond bought tonight will mean a lot to you after the war. It'll mean a lot to your country, and it means a lot to Molly and me personally. The finest thing that could happen to us would be to have every individual listening tonight buy one $25 bond. So stay with it tonight. Until you buy a little piece of victory. And a little peace of mind. Thank you, and God bless you. Good night. Good night, all. This is the National Broadcast.